So look at the irony of it all. Let hate get viral, but don't let the everyday love stories go viral. That government will now decide whether your news is genuine or my news is genuine. But as urbanization did take away some of the glory of the village. I started working as journalist during 1983-1984 period, and that was particularly a, a tough time for India. Right? Of course, there were riots going on at different places in India, and you entered this new field uh, for which there were no schools at that point of time for you to prepare for. It, right? So, how is it like being a new journalist on field and dealing with some of the really important events that were unfolding in the post-partition era? No, actually, uh, print and uh, there was only print journalism at that time, and print journalism across the board for all of us was something you learned on the job. And I believe, with due humility, that we had better training than today. Mm-hmm. The kind of schools that give it to you, because one of the things that's missing today mm-hmm. from practice journalism—I don't know what they teach you in the schools—is beat journalism. And I okay. think that is a huge lacking in. And this is the problem that uh, electronic media and digital has caused, because there is virtually no beat coverages. Mm-hmm. So journalists like you at your age are not trained on the beat. Mm-hmm. You're not trained on, say, the agricultural beat or the civic beat. Or the crime beat, or the university beat, or the courts beat, or the labor beat, or the environment beat, which is why I think the quality mm-hmm. of journalists that you are seeing today mm-hmm. are really more into event-based coverage okay. rather than process-based coverage. So coming back to your question is, at that stage, all of us learned on the job as cup reporters, cup correspondents. You learned on the job. You were uh, trained by seniors. And it was a hard training, mm. but you picked up the picked up the tips, and then if you delivered, you made your way. Okay. Now you've you started your career in 1980s, right? And journalism in 1980s is fairly different from what it is today, as you of course touched in your first answer. So, what is, what are the major differences which you see of of a journalist approaching a story? Of course, one is as you said, it's more of creating an event. Is there anything else? No, I think the seriousness with which stories were done. Which is not to say you don't have some very good journalist uh, journalism today uh-huh. in print. You do. I mean, for instance, if I just look recently at the series done by the Indian Express on the exposure of NCRT yeah. textbooks, that was excellent. Yeah. And I can give many such examples. So it's not like there's no good, uh, uh, you know, sustained uh, print coverage either. But I'm talking about as a rule, you're finding patchy coverage of beats. Mm-hmm. So you don't really know on a given time. Say regularly, what's happening? Say in the Bangalore Municipal Corporation, or in the Bombay Municipal Corporation, the Delhi mm-hmm. Municipal. When there is a furor, when there is some controversy, but what we used to do is used to cover the standing committee meetings, the education committee meetings, the tenders that were passed, the escalation in tenders. Mm-hmm. That's when you caught the corruption in the escalation. Mm-hmm. That is when you knew there were uh, you know syndicates operating across political lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, where all political parties benefited benefited from the road tenders, so you got to know about the system. Mm-hmm. You analyze analyze the system and the ways democratic structures function mm-hmm. through very meticulous daily coverage. Okay, because you were on a beat for three months, six months, one year, two years, and it's only after you accomplished one beat that you went on another beat. There was a semi seniority level for beats. Mm-hmm. You of course ended up with the mantrale or the vidhan mm-hmm. sabha. With Ansuda Beach, which was the prestigious beach, hmm. politics being the pinnacle. But the whole thing was learning meticulously about the process. Hmm. Now I know times have changed, so it's a faster time. There's digital media, there's social media. So in that sense, even journalists have to keep up with that. So I'm not trying to say everything will remain the same. Mm-hmm. But if there was a bit more systemic coverage mm-hmm. of some of these structures, I think there would be more depth in journalism. Okay. So what you're talking about is shift of journalism. As far as the approach is concerned, from how it was, say back in the day to now, can you spot a time when this shift happened? It's very clear to me. Two ah. things were happening. Uh, one is that the uh, new liberal phase in economics, mm-hmm. when you had this entire excitement by a section of the corporate class and the political class of quote unquote opening up the economy, mm-hmm. which was not really opening up; it was monopolizing the yeah. economy. It was actually a contract. It made journalists contract workers. Mm. So we had huge struggles within our profession to try and persuade new journalists. By then, I was at the middle level in mm. the nine, early 1991 mm. to, to, to convince people don't sign contracts, ask mm. for permanent employment. Mm. Because if you ask for permanent employment, you will be more secure in your job, you'll be willing to take risks, and your work will be more consistent. Mm. But no, the employers wanted contractual work. 
they tried to tempt people by quote unquote paying more mm-hmm. but it was a fragile employment because mm-hmm. it could actually get you out of the job very quickly mm-hmm. there was no security of job so it was very clear to me that this entire fragmentation of the media then you had suddenly the pages shifting mm-hmm. you had the regionalization of news so you had the newspaper in a particular state only covering uh, the news of that state Mm. nation page is shrunk mm. uh, then uh, within that you had page three journalism come in so uh, celebrity journalism mm-hmm. all of this started happening with the new liberal phase of economics mm. and around that time four years before something else was happening to our country which is mm-hmm. very very scary which is the growth of majoritarian politics okay 86 87 is the entire ram janmabhoomi movement uh the so called demand for the building of a ram temple which was actually a vicious demand for the demolition of a 450 year old mosque mm-hmm. and the bloodshed that followed mm-hmm. so you're seeing fragmentation of professions and you're seeing fragmentation of indian society mm-hmm. and that was a dangerous mix mm-hmm. it's interesting we're talking about the 80s period and journalism because one more thing happened in the early 80s uh it is said that the golden age of cinema ended with the introduction of color television Did the golden age of journalism also end with the introduction of color television? Uh see I don't I'm not one of those persons who feel, would say that you know television doesn't matter okay. or that video coverage of uh, news or panel discussions are not important mm-hmm. but if they overtake in terms of uh, sensibility mm-hmm. uh, the ability to probe news further look beyond the headline uh you know allow for different views to come in mm. which is at least what your newspaper attempted to do mm. then i think there's a problem so again if you look at early television that so i think i would not make an absolute statement of the kind you were suggesting because when the, when television first came in and you had the old star you know then became nbtv mm. and long before you had all these mushrooming of channels that you see now mm-hmm. over the last 10 12 years uh you still had some extraordinary good coverage yeah because the panel discussions were interested in listening to the views hmm. i mean ala bbc hmm. ala al jazeera they were interested hmm. in listening to the views of the guests on the panel hmm. today it's a khappan channel hmm. today uh, for me the uh, electronic media channels are commercial hmm. they are say commercial in terms of ideology and commercial in terms of money hmm. because they completely sold to either money interests or politics hmm. and with the coming of this regime mm. in 2014 they are completely following the the lackeys of the rich okay. but for two or three sterling exceptions okay so which is why then they don't really become journalism at all mm. they are propaganda too mm. now that we've started talking about television at the current time i want to understand the fact that uh, is it also the tendency of the television viewing audience to want to watch this kind of content because the these television channels they put out numbers where all the channels are number 1 so does it does it seem like no so first i ask you can all channels be number 1 no of course not so there's some problem and racket in the trp yeah. right so i think it's this i've heard this earlier about advertising when they used to make bad ads mm. saying public ones i mm. think the quality of journalism has to be determined by the broadcaster mm. you can't justify propaganda hate and poison by mm-hmm. saying the public wants poison because then where is your ethics and where do you stand mm-hmm. so i think that's a completely non defendable position mm-hmm. i want to talk about early 1990s when you left journalism or rather you shifted to a different kind of journalism perhaps uh that was a time when as we touched upon before j- uh, journalism was entering this commercial zone and you left it what caused the change no for us that is both of us my partner and husband javed anand and myself we had been in journalism for about 10 to 12 years and uh, the, a defining moment was the violence that racked our city bombay mm-hmm. post the uh, demolition of the babri masjid and it created schisms in society deep schisms and it also showed that the mainstream media which is a very much better mainstream media than that okay because it covered events almost honestly etc with some with some uh, anomalies uh is not really keen on following processes mm. so what really interested us at that point is how come this politics of division and sectarianism which is what we call majoritarianism today which is ruling india mm-hmm. uh, is allowed to fester in the mind and before it spills into blood on the streets mm. what is that process mm. the shakha education the rss education the manipulation of textbooks mm. the uh, 
uh, manipulation of history mm-hmm. all of that we were looking at in the mid 80s and 90s mm-hmm. and uh, while publications like it to do a couple of stories they're not interested in over specialization in that area mm-hmm. then you have a big big huge conflict like bombay had in 1992 and there's a fallout there's a fallout of survivors the victims the, the justice process how much can you cover processes the build up and the fallout and we find that mainstream media has limitations they allow at that point there were more space and some of the better publications allowed you to do it to some extent mm. and then they felt that you should get on to other things mm. so we were committed by them to use journalism to look at the politics of hate which is why we started communalism in august 93 mm. and we used journalism as a tool because explorative journalism because that is our metier that is where we were trained mm-hmm. so that is why we published communism combat for almost 20 years mm-hmm. right up to uh, november 2012 uh, you know and uh, it was a monthly it was very highly regarded we had top people writing for us and uh, it explored the phenomenon of majority and minority communalism mm-hmm. uh in the current phase and this topic okay okay as you shifted to communism combat with your magazine Would you also say that that was the time when you kind of shifted from journalism to activism again, or did it happen much later? I think so. I think if you start running a human rights journal, or if you start running a agricultural journal, or mm-hmm. if you start running a labor journal or a law journal, like you have Live Law Today and Bar and Bench Today, I don't think you've given up journalism. It's just you're specializing in one kind of journalism. Mm-hmm. So yes, we started specializing in conflict, uh, conflict. driven journalism so communal conflict caste conflict gender conflict so it was more of a niche it was a niche journalism and the our technique was explorative that okay. we wanted to find out what makes societies uh turn in that direction what poisons the mind what divides people what are the positive tendencies what is the pluralist tendencies as society which are being broken by this so looking at it both from the good news point of view and the detrimental trends mm-hmm. how do you differentiate journalism from activism I think uh, some distinction is uh, is uh, needed but I think there's an overkill there because uh, um, as a journalist while you're covering it and this has been a dilemma since I think the first world war or even before for journalists all over the world if you're covering periods of brute violent conflict mm-hmm. uh, can you at the point of coverage of that conflict not intervene to do something which may not be just holding a camera mm-hmm. or writing a story if it's a question of saving a life okay. or if it is in terms of exposing something which will cause a gross injustice a committal of a crime mm-hmm. for instance so then what would you do as a journalist what would i do as a journalist these are questions mm-hmm. so like for instance when i was covering the 1984 uh, bombay violence in chita camp mm-hmm. and you have Uh, a man uh, in a in a in a shanty who's who who's, who's comes out screaming in front of you is being attacked by a mob uh, you know wielding saffron and uh, his hand is being cut off and his hand gets slashed off in front of your eyes do you stop your coverage for 45 minutes and take him to sign hospital or not i wish i did mm. i believe that's what i should do mm. that's a call every journalist has had to take mm. in his or profession if you are not an arm chair a conditioned anchor hmm. and if you actually doing on ground coverage that's a call you need to take it could be the farmers movement you're covering it could be the students protest you're covering crisis happen hmm. how do you intervene what hmm. steps do you take there have been moments when every journalist and you name saina from the saina nikhil wagle sajid rishi all of us in bombay at that time were called in a, called upon to answer calls of distressed persons particularly from the minority community who were not being given help by the police mm. because the police was being driven in another direction mm. by those who were in power mm. so if they calling you as out of distress because they have your number because you are a reporter yeah. uh do you turn them away or do you take it further and call the police and say in that area help is not reaching mm. is that journalism or is that act mm. that's a question i think all of us need to ask it's a valid question mm-hmm. but it has many many levels and layers mm-hmm. Okay. Now I want to shift a little bit from say niche professions like journalism or activism or practices rather than professions to a much broader idea of our country. A uh, couple of questions on that zone. You've as a journalist as a professional when you were into social life public life there are three to four very major events which you've seen unfold in front of your eyes. Some quite literally 
be it 94, be it Mumbai in the early 90s, of course, be it Gujarat in the early 2000s. And what was at the core of all of these happenings was was communism. And today, when we look at communism from today's prism, today's perspective, it sadly hasn't changed much for many. For many, it might have. Do you think that even after experiencing such brutal, violent cases in our own cities, we've learned very little from it? See, a lot of this has to, is got to do with the local. A lot of this has to be true with the regional, national. A lot of this has to do with the international. Okay. So we have to understand. We look at, for instance, if I take a step back from my country, look at South Asia, look at the world, then there's a huge right towards shift hmm. all over the world. There's hmm. a huge shift towards demagogic leaders. One leader who's supposed to be the panacea of all the ills that a society faces is that notion democrat. For me, it's not. Okay? I don't think one in, one individual can save uh, a people from the problems created, whether it's economic, social, or political. Mm-hmm. You can have charismatic leaders, you can have committed leaders, but this messiah-like figure mm-hmm. who can be the, who's the who who can do no wrong, mm-hmm. the, the, the mindless hero worship is that democratic. And it's happening not just here; it's happening all yeah. over the world, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have to name the names. We know the names. We know them in Turkey. We knew that in America till the last election. We know that in Hungary, it's happening everywhere. So there is one thing that within democracy today is the autocratic autocratization, okay, which is kind of the seizure of democracy by the more privileged sections uh, who do not want the democratic pie to be shared by the largest number. Mm-hmm. Just go back to probably a time when you were not born, which is the Mandal debate. I don't know if you know about it, yeah. which is like around the time the Babri Masjid uh, catastrophe also happened. And that's why they say Mandal ka Mandal ka Mandal Mandal, you know, mm-hmm. that which which preceded what? Mm-hmm. And was Mandal brought into, uh, was the Kamandal brought into actually uh, pepper over the caste schisms mm-hmm. that were thrown up by the Mandal movement? Mm-hmm. Where there was, what was the Mandal? It was the demand that some amount of affirmative action which was given to the scheduled, ca- scheduled tribes and uh, scheduled castes and should be extended also to sections among the other backward castes. You know, and there's a Supreme Court judgment that prompted it in the Rasani judgment. And that caused immense angst for that section of the privileged upper caste youth who were even self-immolating themselves. Okay, so now just look at that symbol, that self-immolation, that kind of a thing, opposing affirmative act. What is it? Any sagacious leadership, any political leadership that wants to take all of society with you, would have sat down and used a language with some data, which is saying that, listen, what we need is more educational institutions. The angst of the young person feels that somebody else is taking over my seat is mm. the wrong way of putting the problem. Mm. If you or I are fifth generation learners, which means that not just you, but your grandfather and the grandfather before him was also educated mm. and had graduation. Can you consider or can I consider myself on par with somebody who's a first generation. Mm. But it was not put like that. Mm. That's not the kind of prism-like understanding that casteism gives you. No. These guys, they're not good. They're not good. It's merit versus nothing to do with merit. Merit is also social capital. Mm. Social capital and privilege in society also gives me merit. I mean, I, I uh, uh, your children might, you might get up with the privilege of speaking English mm. because they have comfort to do so. Whereas somebody who's a migrant labor uh, laborer's child will need will need to a couple of generations to just acquire that social capital. Hmm. Do we see it like that? Was Indian society looking at it like that? Were we democrat? We did, were our democratic sensibilities hmm. mature enough to realize that it's not about us versus them, but it's about all of us together? And how do we decide that this is the pie and we have to divide it amongst us? Hmm. In a same accountable day. Mm. So the Mandal agitation for me is a very good example of what Ambedkar said, Dr. Mm. Baba Sahib said on 26 November 1914. Mm. Then he gave the first draft of the constitution to the constitutors. And he said, you know, we are embarking on a very dangerous path mm. because we are going we are embarking on a road of political democracy with when our society and our societal structure is inherently economically unequal and socially discriminatory. Mm. Now, how many Indians from the top 15% 
where we enjoyed this kind of social and economic privilege for generations, maybe 2000 years, mm. will acknowledge that. Mm. I don't think we will. Yeah. And I, I realize that's a, that's a character flaw of India. Okay. That's a huge character. Mm. But when we talk about democracy, deepening of democracy, uh, Karnataka is just now facing the whole question of reservation for Muslims or not Muslims. Let me talk about that. Look, I have looked at the Constituent Assembly debates on Article 15 and 16, where the first draft of the Constituent Assembly included religious minorities because they were from social economic background class. Mm. But today, no, Muslim, I mean, they don't deserve. So there's no rationality in the debate. Mm. There's no desire to look at that what is the social economic condition of which section and therefore who deserves affirmative action and who does. Mm. To talk a little about religion in India. It's been in the DNA of India. And uh, even if we talk about, say, the post-1947 India, it's not like all the all the leaders of our country, all the prime ministers, like even Jawaharlal Nehru was not completely devoid of religion. You know, he did own up to his identity <laughs> at times. Today, how do you want to look at religion as a similar element in our country? Right? And how how is it, how do you see it develop moving ahead? keeping the entire debate of majority nihilism in mind. See, I think it's not about religion. Hmm? You have to look at a word which has been very well defined by South Asia. India understands it, Pakistan understands it, Sri Lanka understands it. It's communalism. Okay. And what is communalism? Communalism is the manipulation of religion and religious symbols for political ends. Okay. And this, this is a uniquely South Asian term. Hmm. It, in the West, you don't understand it because they look at communitarianism as something positive. Mm. Okay, uh, so I think we need to understand the evolution of our debates mm. <laughs> within the South Asian subcontinent on the issues of citizenship, on the issues of uh, who is an Indian. Mm. And there are intense debates in the Constituent Assembly too, to say that we do not want religion based citizenship. Okay. And this resurfaced during the anti-CA protests yeah. and the anti-NRC uh, protests. Mm. Now, very interestingly, what's happening in India between say 1905 and 1937. And I'm taking, giving a little bit of a history lecture mm. because it's inevitable. I yeah. think journalists should be aware of this, particularly when you're looking at communalism and the build-up of majoritarian politics. 1905, did you know that the British tried to partition Bengal? And when they tried to partition Bengal, there was a popular upsurge. Hindus and Muslims came together, tying Rakhis, Rabindranath Tagore's famous song was written, mm -hmm. saying, you will not let you partition the state. Mm -hmm. Now, a question I'd like to ask young people is that without my telling you, look at the history between 1905 and 1937. How did sentiments change? And then you'll understand uh, some of the answers I'm trying to give you, mm -hmm. which is that Within the national movement to drive out the British, which was even predates 1857 actually, because you had the Adivasi yeah. farmers, you had the agrarian classes revolting, the indigo farmers, the Santa Rebel in the, uh, uh, I mean, you had all over the country from Assam to Bengal to uh, modern day Andhra Pradesh and Telangana uh, revolts yeah. of the small agrarian class because they felt the exploitation of colonialism before the urban classes went. Mm -hmm. Before that famous Dalabai Navroji pamphlet mm -hmm. on poverty and what mm -hmm. the British have done to us. At that time, when this all this was brewing, the national movement and the movement, mass movement to get the British out, the debate was also what kind of India do we want? Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of India are we looking at? So you had the you had a, in the late uh, in the late uh, 19th century, you had influences like Fule. Ambedkar, uh, all of that which were vibrant, yeah. which were saying that, you know, as much as we are talking about driving out the British, we want the elite of here to listen, that you are also casteists. So there was also churning from within, mm. that there was a demand from the subaltern caste that we want education, we want fair play, we want non-discrimination mm. and we want equality. So there's both kinds of tussles were going on. Mm. And at that time, between, okay, coming back to 1905 and 30, 1937, while this overall movement for emancipation, equality, and anti-colonialism was growing, you also had suddenly forces among the elite. Which elite? The Hindu and the Muslim elite both and the Sikh elite emerge mm. to say we want a nation state for us, mm. not for the other, not for all. Mm. 
who are these movements of course we know muslim league and pakistan but it's also hindu mahasabha savarkar and the rashtriya swayam sevak sangh which will be 100 years old in 1920 in 2025 and which runs the government today it's not a bjp government hmm. bjp is a parliamentary wing of the rss hmm. so what you have in power is a force that believes in sectarian religion based citizenship that does not believe in what our constituent as assembly believed that's the danger india is facing today. that's the danger the majority of us we are facing today so the bloodshed started the riots started the conflict started you had you had the muslim league and the uh, hindu mahasabha and the and the rss pulling popul- sections of the population in the anti direction mm-hmm. saying we are looking for a, a muslim state or a hindu state and there were sikh voices were talking about khalsa yeah. which was smaller so that is what resulted in the schism Hmm. and then of course you had you before the pakistan resolution this is what i'm trying to do before the pakistan resolution let's look at the politics of this hmm. which were the forces on the hindutva side that were pushing muslim which is not to say muslim league is not responsible hmm. but i'm saying that equally responsible is the hindutva side hmm. saying we wanting a hindu state hmm. what was on the other side was a composite rush hmm. or we want citizenship for all unfortunately we lost the battle and the british Did you know British preponed partition by six months mm. so that they they could uh, and that's when the riots broke out. Mm. If they had stayed on for six months, maybe the entire thing could have been settled in a better way. Mm. So the British also had their design and playing divide and rule, but we fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Mm. And there were enough forces within India. I've already mentioned their name that wanted the <coughs> wanted religion based decision. Mm. I consider the decision of the Indian Constituent Assembly. between 46 and uh, 1950 within which partition happened because that was 40, 47 uh the most mature and pragmatic decision that despite and in spite of the creation of pakistan hmm. they said we have to have a composite now why do i see that if you look at the what what you look at what uh, jai pal singh said you look at what every single even k munshi what he said hmm. was supporter of the right wing in one sense Hmm. So the only way to get India to remain together, a diverse people, diverse faith, diverse uh, ethnicities, diverse languages, hmm. is by giving them the dream of equality and non-discrimination. Even if that is not a reality, hmm. at least the dream should be that we are all equal. Hmm. That we believe that we are all Indians. Hmm. Nobody can say I'm less of an Indian. Today, what is being said? That some people are less Indian than others, hmm. and then very Indianness is being. constantly and viciously questioned mm. on the basis of what they eat on the basis of what they believe on the basis of what they wear mm. and this is happening right from the top and there are foot soldiers below who are lynching etc so i'm just trying to say it's not about religion per se mm. it is about political structure and religion based citizenship and communalism not religion per se mm. just to end a very uh, pithy answer mm. look at the difference between say somebody like uh gandhi mm-hmm. jina adwani personally non believers were jina and adwani mm-hmm. gandhi was a believer yeah and who believed in a composite citizenship it was he believed that india can only remain together if all religions are treated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i and, and who is being removed from our textbooks today and why and his assassination with story being removed and who killed him and the fact that rss was banned why this is history mm. you can't do anything with this history mm. it will remain in the minds of people even if you remove it from the textbook mm. but why do the powers that be need to remove this from the text mm. that's the question journalists need to ask like some newspapers are asked mm. but only some <clears throat> coming to the end of this huge very interesting interview Violent riots took place 1947. That very year, of course, several years before that. Violent riots took place after 2016, also in the current age. I say 2016, 2015, 2016 because there are two variables which are similar. That is riots on the basis of religion. But there is one major change that has happened a few years ago, at least say a decade ago, and that is the entry of India per se in the information age or the role of social media. while as it was thought about cities that cities might break down castes it did otherwise so was said about 
I mean, unless let's, they did reduce cars to uh-huh. some extent. Uh-huh. Though, of course, our safari cam cars are only Dalits. Yeah, yeah. And our ghettos remain. But as urbanization did take away some of the cruelties of the village, mm-hmm. which is why Baba Sahib Ambedkar's statement for the village being the receptacle Center. of uh, mm-hmm. cruelty, which is not Gandhi's image of the village, is yeah. something we need to also look at yeah. seriously. Yeah. Sure, sure. I agree. Uh, what I'm talking about is the rise of digital media. Many people thought that several of these say fake information or because by having a bigger umbrella of information, it will end up helping people. No one knew it would go so wrong. It ended up spreading fake news on the basis of every aspect of human's life. Now, finally, how do you see the future of all of these things in the age of social media? Right? There is, do you see a kind of reversal to the uh, Ganga, Jamuni, Tehzeeb that was popular back in the day or like the union between different religions or do you see things probably and sadly only getting worse? See, I'll just need, I'll, I think the distinction we need to make is that yeah, digital media or rather so, uh, there are two different things you're saying. Digital media is not social media. Digital media which travels faster than uh, print. So in that sense you're right but social media has a life of its own and it's a bear. So it's a huge, big beast. Hmm. And as our studies have shown, it's a beast that is run by market capital. Yeah. It is run by market capital and the kind of algorithms that are created, let hate get viral, but don't let the everyday love stories go viral. Because hmm. algorithms are created yeah. for that purpose. So we have to ask those companies, those mega companies, whether it is Meta or whether it is uh, Twitter or whether it is the same, why the algorithms are created in that way, which is also something we are doing along with groups all over the world. We are asking Meta these questions. We are just a small player, but yeah. as a collective, we are asking. So I think you have to understand why it's happening. Mm-hmm. It's happening because governments and corporations want populations to behave in a certain way. Okay. And there's a design behind it. Okay, that's one thing. So it's, it's a huge thing which is, could be seen to be beyond our control. Mm. Then when you have a government in place, that is also wanting to play the same game as some of these meta corporations, mm. the mega corporations. Mm. Then you have a coming together, mm. which you are seeing in India today and in many other countries like this. So the question is, what is your buffer? Mm. This morning's media uh, newspapers told us that they are trying to now digital control fake. The government will now decide what is fake and not. Mm. When we know that the biggest troll army is owned by the BJP. So look at the irony of it all. That the BJP's IT cell whose man sitting on the IT cell and whose IT cells in Karnataka and everywhere else spread poison, that government will now decide whether your news is genuine or my news is genuine and, and uh, the, the RSS organizers have been given the syndication for the website. Mm-hmm. Instead, anyway, we know the government is using RSS-based fields rather than PTI mm-hmm. because they were not happy with PTI's inflows. Mm-hmm. So we have to link it to this, okay. that there's an ideological push towards hate, which is state-driven, <coughs> power-driven, which is also matching what the meta-corporations are doing with the algorithms of coming at your social media. Yeah. So it's a very dangerous phase that we are living in. Okay. So the reply and the response to that, of course, has to be political. Mm-hmm. That there has to be a way of that can these people ever be got out of power? Mm. Can you ever democratically, electorally, throw forces which have captured democratic institutions like the RSS has out of power? That's the question you need to ask. I don't have an answer. I hope so, but it could be very difficult. I was going to ask you the answer. Yeah. You say you no, I mean, it's like, how can I predict the future? Of I mean, uh, are proto fascists ever thrown out of power? Mm. Are proto fascists, once they capture power, do they just bow down and accept an election result? No, they buy up people. Mm. They're buying up people all the time. Nobody, the election commission is not asking them, where are you getting that 50 crores or 100 crores to buy up an MLA? That question is not being asked. Electoral bonds, we don't know where is the money. We don't know whether it's the legit money, mm-hmm. whether it is in that under Adani Shell account or it is in buying up MLS, where it's coming from. Because institutions are not this, are not being able to ask these questions. Because institutions have also been infiltrated. Yeah. So we are in really a lock jam. Mm-hmm. And the only answer can be if there is a systematic people's movement against it. Mm-hmm. We've only seen spurts, we've only seen moments. You don't see a massive organization of people yet. Look at what happened in the United States when the uh, Black Lives Matter campaign, mm. when Trump first came to power. Mm. You had hundreds of thousands of women on the streets against Trump. The first time he won. Mm. Uh, then when the Black uh, Lives Movement happened. And you had white people mm. standing up in the Black Lives Matter. You have today the non-entitled sections who are being attacked, who are being lynched, 
whether it is Muslims or Dalits, Adivasis, we see in the lynching how many of the upper caste, upper class privileged sections are bothering to come out and speak. For me, it's a test of Indian character, it's a test of Indian politics. I don't know whether India will deliver. Hmm. And hope for it. Thank you so much. We must. Yeah. Thank you so much for this interview. It was like reading a very interesting textbook <laughs> while the time I was interviewing. I'm sorry, if the answers went in different. No, it, it was way. all. It was all in line with the questions. Interestingly, it, I did not follow any of the questions which I had written, but I think that's what makes up for an interesting interview. So thanks a lot. Finally, if you got anything to say which you thought I missed out on asking, which you wanted to answer, you could listen. No, I just say that you know when we look at. Uh, I mean, the only thing that gives me a lot of hope huh? is when I see, uh, because you're talking about journalists, when I see young journalists, not so young journalists, despite and in spite of all this, doing some exemplary work in very difficult times. And I think that's important to record and remember because the time when I joined, like what you started by asking me, were in that sense easier times politically, hmm. socially. It was that you had a little space. Uh, it was possible, though we formed the Women and Media Committee. Uh, we formed the Women and Media Committee in 1986 mm. for two reasons. Portrayal of the women in the media and also conditions of women journalists. We started demanding night duty. That women should, uh, women should be allowed to do night duty, cover conflict issues as much as others. Things are much more difficult for young women journalists today. Mm. Because of the structure, because of the tightening up of things and because of the writing atmosphere. Mm. So I think a lot of things are becoming more difficult for young journalists and for other professions. Yet you find exemplary work coming out, amazing work coming yeah. out. From the, I don't want to name individual portals because it's not fair, but some outstanding work coming out in the in the Hindi language, in the Malayalam language, in the Kannada language, and of course in the English language. Hmm. Newspapers also continue, despite the pressures, to come out with extraordinarily in-depth coverage hmm. of certain issues at least. One wishes there were more of that, hmm. but then I know the difficult times that that, that even newspaper editors are living under. So I think the hope lies in the democratic movements, small and big, that are taking place in every corner of the country. Okay. Because people are challenging yeah. this kind of hegemony. Mm -hmm. People are challenging this majority. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's no challenge to it. Yeah. It's just that today we're not seeing a political cohesion in the opposition being able to garner a, a, a substantive program mm -hmm. which is captures the imagination to counter the hate program of the ruling party. Mm. Suddenly, if something descends into uh, hysterical nationalism, mm. will we have an answer? Yeah. What is our answer? What is the political answer? Mm. I think people are giving an answer, but what is the political opposition going to give? Mm. So that is the kind of uh, 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 point we are standing at. That will the political opposition in this country, which is far from perfect, against whom we have loads of issues that which we have raised when they've been in government, hmm. will they be able to do a systemic cohesive challenge to this majority? Hmm. I think people are challenging it yeah. fragmentedly, in pockets, different sections, but you need a mass upsurge like hmm. you had at the time of the freedom they struggle yeah. and, and the emergency, absolutely. Yeah. I was 16 when the emergency uh, you know, 15 when it was declared and 16 and a half when it was lifted mm. and it was my standard 10 exams and my father told me, forget about your exams, just campaign against the Congress party, we have to get them out. Mm. And Bombay returned six seats to the Party. Mm. And lawyers, homes were places where posters were being decided and stuck and all of that my father was about. So, I mean, just like happened, you know, either during the freedom struggle or during the emergency, is the intelligence here, are the elite classes willing to stake everything? Mm. Because it is the entitled that have to come forward. Mm. The others are doing it anyway because they are at the receiving end. Mm. But the, and, and, and I think the most, the biggest hurdle today is this huge, humongous middle class, mm. which has got so aspirational, over aspirational with consumerism, mm. that they really believe that this does not affect us. Yeah. And Hindu Rashtra is not going to really matter to us. Now that is a fallacy if you think our women are not going to be attacked. These are your women. If lynchings will not reach violent stages at, in, within all communities. Look at the number of people who are leaving India. Educated people. So I think these are serious questions but I don't think we can afford to be hopeless and we need to keep noting the positives as much as the overwhelming reality that we are facing. Thanks so much. Man.